All right, guys, do a little moment silence here. Confess any uh, known or unknown sins. God, thank you for giving us this time together to worship you by the study of your word. Just uh, help me speak with clarity. Be with me as I try to disseminate your word. We ask this all in your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. All right, so without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those that earnestly seek him. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Let's turn the word today to Deuteronomy 4, 32. All right, open with a little joke here. So, after service, a new pastor was shaking hands with his parishioners. When one woman turned bright red and looked down at the ground as she shook his hand, she said, Pastor, I hope you didn't take it personally when my husband walked out during your sermon. The pastor replied, Well, I did wonder, but I hope and I pray that he's not ill. The woman said, Oh, no, he's fine. And trust me, it's not a reflection of you, Pastor. I can assure you of that. The thing is, my husband's been walking in his sleep ever since he was a child. So the goal is to uh, not put you guys to sleep here tonight. Hopefully you guys walk away with something. So one of the greatest tools God ever gave us is our hands. Think about it. With our hands, we can work to make a living. Before I was in the army and as a soldier, I used my hands in order to take life, now I'm a paramedic and I use my hands to restore life. With our hands, we can greet others with a handshake, or we can curse others with a middle finger. With our hands, we approve others with a thumbs up and disapprove others with a thumbs down. We can show the loving caress to someone we love with just a stroke of a hand, or we can use our hands in the shape of a fist to strike others we hate. And I was doing some research for this sermon and just by holding the hand of a loved one, it releases two powerful hormones throughout the human body. Oxytocin, which is known as the feel-good hormone, and cortisol, which significantly lowers the stress. The bottom line is our hands put our thoughts into action. A, Persian, a Prussian philosopher said the hand is the visible part of the brain. As you guys remember from my father's series on the Hebrew alphabet, the gospel throughout it, uh, he brought up the interesting fact of the sacred tetragrammaton, that yod He vav He throughout scripture. And of course, as we saw, the Yud is represented by the hand, the hay, which is behold, vav, the nail, and hay again, behold. You put it together and it's hand, behold, the nail, behold. Of course, that points to our Lord on the cross as he died for our sins. But think about it. Why does he choose the hand there? Was not his feet also pierced? Was not his face, face pummeled? To a bloody pulp? Was not the, the skin ripped and scorched from his body? But he chose to put his hand in his very name. There's indeed something very special about the human hand. Each hand contains 29 major and minor bones, 29 major joints, and at least 123 named ligaments. 
There are 34 muscles dedicated to move just the fingers and the thumb. In the hand, there are 48 nerves and 30 named arteries. One quarter of the brain's motor, uh, motor, motor cortex, which is the area that controls the movement throughout the body, is solely dedicated to moving the hand. And there are over 2,500 nerve receptors per square centimeter in the human hand. No, God did not equip us with the eyes of an eagle. As one minister put it, perhaps some of us see too much of what we aren't supposed to be looking at already. God did not give us the strength of a bear. Perhaps some of us depend on our own human strength too much as it is. And no, he did not give us the speed of a cheetah, but he gave us human hands. With our hands, we are able to subdue the animal kingdom and reign master over them. With our hands, we are able to build a telescope, able to see further than every than every or any eagle have ever dreamed. With our hands, we have built cranes, able to lift more than a bear ever could. And with our hands, we have built airplanes and automobiles, able to travel faster than a cheetah ever dreamed. Hands are mentioned over 1,032 times in the Bible. All kinds of hands are mentioned throughout the Bible. There's evil hands. Mighty hands, good hands, purified hands, and finally pierced hands. One phrase that is often used in connection with the hand of God throughout Scripture is the Hebrew phrase nata zeroa, and it means with an outstretched arm. The phrase is used in the Bible to describe God's powerful deeds in dealing with his people. I told you guys to turn to Deuteronomy 4, verse 32. We'll go down, read to 35. So this was a picture of Israel coming into the promised land after God had miraculously intervened time and time again with the Israelites. It says, ask now about the former days, long before your time. From the day God created human beings on earth, as from one end of the heavens to the other, has anything so great as this ever happened, or has anything like it ever been heard of? Has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of a fire, as you have and lived? Has God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by signs, Wonders by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds, like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes. You were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Besides him, there is no other. So there are many instances of this phrase, but here we have... As I said already, God speaking to the nation, Israel, telling them how many times that he has come to them with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. In Psalm 136, it says something similar. It says, to him who smote the Egyptians and their firstborn, for his loving kindness is everlasting and brought Israel out of their midst. For his loving kindness is everlasting with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. For his loving kindness is everlasting. So God's hand and outstretched arm are constantly working throughout scripture to redeem us, to restore us, and finally to protect us. Think about it. All the little stories and instances throughout the Bible, even in the very first instance with Adam and Eve, you have the fall of Adam and then God coming and redeeming him by making a sacrifice and then clothing him to restore him and finally to protect him. And God does the same thing for us. I'm sure all of us can look back in our lives and see how God used his hand to protect us. I often thinking about my teenage years and uh, I'm amazed by some of decision, the decisions that I've lived through personally. I remember cliff jumping off 
crazy cliffs in Newport and driving in a matter that I wasn't supposed to be driving in, but I'm still here today. There's no doubt when I get to heaven, I'll look back and I'll see God's hand there protecting me. So our whole Christian walk is based on letting Christ work through our hands. That's how we get our rewards, allowing God to come into our life and to work through us. So the question is, what are we doing? What are you doing with your hands? What are we doing with our hands? Are we solely using them to work tirelessly, to gain worthless items in the devil's kingdom, or are we using them to further God's kingdom? When we look at Christ and his ministry, his life, he was constantly using his hands to better the lives of God's people. You know, even in Mark, it says that he was, uh, is this not the, the carpenter's son or a, a carpenter? That, that word tectum, it means an artisan, someone that used his hands to make a living. So we see in his ministry, we see him using his hands to feed the poor, to turn water into wine, to save his doubting disciple from drowning. And we see him use his hands to raise the dead. He does amazing things with his hands, and yet in John 14, he says, Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will be doing even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So don't get weird on me. I'm not saying that we'll be going around raising the dead and turning water into wine, but as we know here, there is the apostolic gifts that gave validity to the apostles and disciples' messages until the canon was completed. But he says we'll do greater things than these. That's the Greek word megas, and it means more abundant. Remember, as my dad pointed out before, you know, Christ's ministry was only around three years, and in the Bible, there's only something like 50 days recorded. So God gives us all this opportunity to participate in his, his story, history. He's given us all time, talent, treasure, and two hands to accomplish his work for our lives. So again, the question is, what are we doing with our hands? Are we solely using them to work tirelessly, to gain worthless items, or are we using them to further God's kingdom? Remember, God has given us all a unique gift and special purpose, and not all hands are equal, and not everyone is called to do the same thing. Think about it. You see, a golf club in my hands usually results in a lot of lost golf balls. But a golf ball in Tiger Woods' hands, well, that's a PGA championship. A fast car in my hands usually results in a lot of speeding tickets. But in a fast car in Jeff Gordon's hands, well, that's a series cup championship. A piano in my hands is a bunch of unorganized noise. But in Beethoven's hands, it's a beautiful symphony. And likewise, my life. In my own hands will no doubt result in turmoil, pain, and suffering. But if I place my life in God's hands, that's peace, it's comfort, it's, the, it's security, and God's salvation. So what makes us victorious in God's kingdom is not the talent of our hands, but the ability to trust our lives in God's hands. And when we look at God and put our lives in his care, we will be victorious no matter what we face in this life. Let's all turn to uh, Exodus 17, verse 8, and see what the Israelites did when they were in battle. Verse 
What chapter was that, Pastor? It was uh, Exodus 17, verse 8. So a little background. So the Israelites are leaving Egypt, circling around in the desert for 40 years. They finally get back into the promised land, and they're uh, attacking some tribes. But here is the first known battle in which the Amalekites come and they attack. They actually lead attack on the Israelites. And uh, it's, it's written about, I think, in 1 Samuel or Chronicles, but it talks about how they did something terrible there. And a lot of scholars believe that as they were coming into this oasis, Seraphidim, that uh, it was a narrow, narrow, uh, passageway they had to go through and so they waited to, to all the warriors went through this passageway and they came around back and they attacked everyone at the back of the camp which were the disabled the women and children so they did something terrible there and god wasn't having it so it says in verse 8 the malachites came and attacked the israelites at rapidin moses said to joshua choose some of our men go out and fight the malachites Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Ur went up to the top of the hill. And as long as Moses held his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Ur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek, of Amalek under heaven. Moses built an altar and he called it Yehovah Nessie, where the Lord is my banner. So we see some interesting typology there. As long as Moses' hands were raised, as long as he held the staff of God up, the Israelite army had the courage to face the enemy in battle. Their banner was Moses, their leader, raising his hands high with his arms stretched out and when israel saw their leader they were victorious in battle they knew that they had god fighting the battle for them but eventually moses's humanity got the best of them and he became tired his arms went down and <coughs> israelites lost their courage and the Mal malachites started to win the battle same is true for us, you know, we are in a spiritual battle every single day. And our, ad, and our enemy, our great adversary, the devil and his forces are there, weighing us down. But our banner isn't Moses, it's Yeshua, Jesus. And he also had his hands high and outstretched, but they didn't fall because they were nailed. This work on the cross by our Savior is now our inspiration, our Jehovah Nisi, our banner. This is why as Christians, the cross hangs around our necks, hangs in our houses, hangs in our cars. But more importantly, it needs to hang in our thinking. God is our banner and he fights our battles for us. If we put our lives in his hands, we will always come out victorious. Now, as soon as we leave these doors, we are back on the battleground. And in some instances, we don't even have to leave these doors. The battleground could be right in here. Our three enemies are constantly looking to bring us down. The flesh, the devil, and his forces. And how do we win the battle? Just like the Israelites look to their leader, we, we win the battle by looking at our Savior on that cross. With his 
outstretched arms paying the price for our sins. When we dwell on sin and past failures, we're denying that victory that took place there. And that was won once and for all. Remember, on the cross, he said it was finished. And that goes back to the high priest and sacrificing the sabbatical lamb. And when he was done, he yelled out, it is finished. That signified that the sacrifice had been made. Jesus is our high priest, and he tells us that the ultimate sacrifice has been made. So it doesn't matter what we've done or what we've been through, because it was all bought with a price. The other night I was watching an antiques road show. Anyone ever watched that show? I watched it last night. I did? Yeah. And uh, I was really amazed at what some of these people would pay for seemingly worthless stuff. There was uh, this one guy that brought in some cups, and it turns out that they were Chinese rhinoceros horn cups worth about a million dollars. So what was probably something I would throw away, someone would be willing to pay a million dollars for. You know, there's a good analogy there. At times when I screw up, I look at myself in the mirror, and I say, what a piece of work. What a piece of work. Why did you think that? Why did you do that? And I feel worthless. But then I remember my banner. The Lord upon that cross and willing, what he was willing to pay for me and willing to pay for each of us. Remember, even one person, for one person, he would have went through the torture on the cross. You see, those nails piercing our Lord's perfect hands is now our symbol of freedom. The Lord hanging on the cross shouldn't be viewed in grief and sorrow, but in victory for those three hours on the cross where he was separated from his father, it sent shockwaves through every universe and every dimension. And the imagery of his mighty hands and outstretched arms are now etched into every creature. To the believer, it's a picture of the ultimate ransom being purchased on our behalf. And to the unbeliever, it will be an everlasting memory that the invitation was there, him, with his arms open. Now there's a verse in Isaiah that says, Behold, I have you inscribed, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. This is, of course, speaking of a security and protection. And just as Christ sits on the right hand of God, and we have been inscribed upon God's hand, we see something interesting when we look at our own right hand. Isaiah says, For I, the Lord, your God, hold your right hand. And our right hand, if we put it up to our face, we have the name of Yeshua. We have the thumb, we have the yud, we have the shin, we have the vav, and the an. The very name of God is on our hand. Now, Jesus, of course, is not the name of our Savior, as we just saw. Uh, uh, Jesus is a transliteration of a transliteration from Yeshua, from the Hebrew to Greek, Yesu, to the Latin, Isus, and then we get Jesus. But as we saw, there's something special about Yeshua. Not only what does it mean our salvation, our Redeemer, but it's on our hand. So his hand is everywhere throughout scripture, but more importantly, it needs to be everywhere in our daily thoughts and actions. We need to draw near to him and take his hand. You know, one of the uh, favorite things our family likes to do is go down to Newport, and every time we go down there, we go around Ocean Drive, and we uh, usually stop off at 7-Eleven, or we bring some old bread. We feed all the birds there. And um, last time I was there, there's really like three types of birds. It's a good analogy there. When you throw out some bread, there's uh, birds that always are off in the background. They make the most noise. They squawk a lot. And they bring other birds 
And the second group of birds, they get a little closer. They never get too close, but they usually eat some of the crumbs that uh, the first or the third set of birds leave behind. The third set of birds, you gotta watch them because they'll come right up to you. They'll eat the bread out of your hand. I remember as a kid, my, I think, there, I don't know if there's a video of it, but my, my father told me to hold up a piece of bread. And I think I was like six years old at the time. I wasn't paying attention. All of a sudden, this bird comes flying down, bites my finger, takes a piece of bread away, and I'm left crying. Thanks, Dad. But, Child abuse. <laughs> you know, it's a good analogy there. You know, we need to be like that third set of birds. We need to come boldly to the hand of God. Hebrews 4:16 says, "Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace." so that we may receive mercy to find grace to help in the time of need. That word confidence is parousia, and it means fearless, with openness, and to boldly approach. And we have one life here on earth, but what we choose to allow God to do through our hands can send ripples throughout eternity. Not only in this life, but of course in the next, you know, I'm going to leave you guys with one last thing. And uh, it's a story that I heard a couple of years ago. And I thought it uh, had some pretty deep analogies to it. So there was these two brothers, a younger and an older one. Uh, the older brother was coming home from school. And as he started walking closer to his house, he noticed that there was a big billow of smoke coming from around his street. And as he started walking a little bit faster, he turned the corner and he saw that the smoke was coming from his house. So obviously he sprinted to the house and he was about to count it as a loss because the whole thing was engulfed until he heard his little brother scream for his name. So in one bold move, he rushed into the house to find his brother and miraculously, he came out holding his little brother's in his hands. But unfortunately, he was burned on 80% of his body. It took him years to recover, skin grafts and all. But one day, he did finally make a miraculous recovery and uh, he missed a lot of school. Now his uh, younger brother was going to high school with him and one day they were, got out of class and they were walking home. And they saw a group of kids, you know, pointing and staring and making fun of the kid that had skin grafts all over his face. And he started crying and really hurt him. But to the little brother, he looked at those scars as beauty because he remembered what he went through. He knew that because of those scars, he was alive today. You know, something similar will happen when we enter heaven Christ will be the only one with those piercings, those marks and scars on his side and on his hands. And it'll be a sign of beauty to us. So I guess we'll end there. Say a quick prayer. Father God, thank you for uh, letting us look at the hands throughout scripture and helping us to recall that it's because of your hands that we are safe and secure in your victory, help us to remember this message, to place our life in your hands and to not use our hands for evil, but to use them to advance your kingdom. We ask all this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you both.